Well, thank you, the Norris sisters. They need to get a big old bus and get on the road. You didn't see the other one. The other one was hiding behind the piano. Um, thank you, girls. Appreciate that so much. So today, uh, if you would open your Bibles to 1 Kings. We're going to end this series of, of King Solomon. We've, this is our third week here. Uh, if you'll turn to 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11 is where we'll find the last week uh, where we'll end up King Solomon uh, this week. So last week we saw Solomon at the very height of his rule as king of Israel. God had blessed him beyond imagination. He was the wisest man ever to live. Even though, as I said before, he had a thousand wives, and I'm not sure that that shows much wisdom. He is known throughout the world. He was known throughout the world because of his riches, his skill, his knowledge, his ability to build every impressive building, like we talked about last week in the temple and, and his palace and, and all the other buildings that, that they built in Israel during his reign. However, at the beginning of 1 Kings chapter 11, we begin to see Solomon's life as a paradox. He was the wisest man ever to live, yet he made some very foolish and destructive choices. He was an incredibly blessed man, but he did not always steward God's blessings faithfully. He knew God's law, but he didn't keep it. He led the nation to a golden age of peace and prosperity and uh, profitable trade and magnificent temple was built during his time, yet he also led it into decline, and he set it up for collapse. Solomon serves as both example and warning. Like Solomon, we need to learn how to steward God's gifts responsibly, but we, but we typically have a sinful tendency to take good things and use them wrongly, like sex or money or food or influence or wonderful blessings when used according to for God's glory that they can be abused and can ultimately destroy our lives. So let's look at our, our text today, 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 1. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women. For the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, Neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses, 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Asherath, the goddess of the Sidians, and after Milcom, the ab abomination of the Am Amorites. Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord, as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chesmas, the, the abomination of Moab, and to Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites, on the mountain east of, of Jerusalem. And so he did for all of his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrifice to their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him con concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord had commanded. So this chapter seems to come out of nowhere, right? You, we were going through the uh, first 10 chapters, uh, and, and we see Solomon, and we're reminded of his glory, of his success, of his wisdom, his devotion to God, and then suddenly, chapter 11, there's disaster. What led to this downfall? Well, the downfall was actually predicted. If you'll remember in week one, for those of you that were here, I told you when we read the first two verses of, of chapter 3, uh, I told you to, to make a mental note of those, nurse, of those verses or to actually draw brackets around them because they would show up again. Let me remind you of what they said. We thought that they were maybe throwaway verses. So if you'll look back at chapter 3, the opening verses, I said that the, at week 1 of this series, Solomon made a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He took Pharaoh's daughter and he brought her into the city of David 
till he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people were sacrificing at high places. However, because no house had been built for the name of the Lord, Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father, only he sacrificed and made offerings at, at the high places. So, so you see, from week one, Solomon's downfall was predictable. We see at the beginning of Solomon's reign, he was knowingly doing these things that was against the commandments of God. And in spite of being the wisest man to ever live, he never dealt with the subtle sins and continued to give them a place of residence in his life. Riken says that we start falling into sin long before we ever fall into disgrace. But there's a lot more going on here than a lust for uh, exotic women. In ancient times, the kings would marry uh, another king's daughter for security reasons. In other words, if, if, if I married your daughter or you married mine, the, the conflict would be, would be less between us. I would be less likely to attack your kingdom because my daughter lives there. and We have kind of an alliance with that. So the idea um, clarifies it. it. When we looked at, at uh, verse 11, we saw that of, of his thousand wives, 700 of them were princesses. So Solomon was using these marriages not for love, not because he, he saw somebody was uh, fell in love with him, but it was it was usually a security uh, treaty that that, uh, that he was making with other kingdoms. But as we as we saw in our in our uh, in our text in Deuteronomy and from the Deuteronomy verse that that uh, God told them not to make these kinds of marriages because they didn't need treaties. God would be their security. And Solomon and all of the Israel, all of the Israelite people for that matter, knew this commandment. Notice in verse two, if you'll just look at chapter 11, verse two, how God says, for surely they will turn away your heart from their God. Surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Not maybe they will turn away or there's a slight chance that they'll turn away, but surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. But Solomon wasn't satisfied with just the promises of God. He needed a little extra insurance. We see Solomon not just being disobedient. He was being deliberately disobedient. Solomon's downfall stemmed from a heart problem. Six times in the first, cha in the first nine verses of of chapter 11 we see Solomon's heart being led astray in verse 2 it says turn your heart after their gods in verse 3 it says his wives turned his heart away in verse 4 it says turned away his heart after other gods his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God and as was the heart of David his father in verse 9 it says the Lord was angry and solemn at Solomon because his heart had turned away from Yahweh Solomon's story began in the statement in 1 Kings 3. He said Solomon loved the Lord. And now at the beginning of chapter 11, it says Solomon loved many foreign women. Gradually, Solomon grew attached to these women, and they turned his heart away. For most of his wives, Solomon built their own palace. Uh, he, and he built uh, not only a palace, but he built an altar for them to worship to their gods. Uh, and, and he did that for many of his, of, of his wives who served foreign gods. And if that wasn't sinful enough or disobedient enough, as he grew older, he began to worship at those altars with his foreign wives. Uh, so he actively participated in the worship of foreign gods. Solomon's core problem was a heart of unbelief. That's always the case of our sin. You peel back the layers of any sin, and you'll find the seed of unbelief. By the way, uh, just on a side note, this same command is, is repeated in the New Testament uh, about not being in unequally yoked with uh, unbelievers. And I think I've got this in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. It says, do, this is Paul speaking, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnerships has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Baal? What portion does a believer say share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? 
for we are the temple of the living God. So why does Paul give the warning to New Testament Christians? For the very same reason God gave it to the Israelites. Surely they will turn your heart away from God. In whatever area of life you are not fully obeying God, it's because it's a, an area where you're afraid. You're afraid that, that uh, you'll be let down. Uh, so here's my question. Where do you not trust the promises of God? And where are you hedging your bet? Let me su suggest some of the most common offenders here. I see a lot of people uh, falter in obedience, specifically in the area of romance, dating someone you shouldn't be dating, not trusting God's timing. You believe that if you get this one wrong, your life will be miserable, so you have to keep control of that one for yourself. Another one that touches most of us is the area of money. The majority of church-going people do not obey in this area of finances. Give the first and the best. The Bible suggests that we give 10%. Again, for most of it, it's not because they're defiant or even stingy, but because they're afraid. What if I can't pay my bills? What if I get hit with a rainy day? Or can I really live a happy life considering that 10 or 20% is gone from my disposable income? And you hear the promises of God of how he will bless and multiply you and he, when you give your first and best, but you don't really trust those promises. Let me also say that this is for all believers, young, old, rich, poor. It doesn't matter. If you're a believer, God has, has given us the command to give back our very first and very best back, uh, back to him. And if you're sitting here today and you're saying, well, I don't have a job, I'm really not old enough, I'm kind of stretched out, and you're waiting until you can afford to tithe, you're completely missing the point of giving. God commands that we give him our very first and very best. God says through the prophet Malachi that God's people were robbing him by not giving back in their tithes and their contributions. Then in Malachi 3.10, God commands them to bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Those are some tremendous uh, words, and uh, I believe it's the only place in Scripture where God says, try me, test me. In this area. Maybe I should have said that before we took the offering up this morning. One more. Some people can't trust God when life throws them a curveball. Uh, you lose your job, you get passed over for, uh, for a promotion, you have an injury, maybe you have an unexpected medical diagnosis, and your first impulse is, God, you don't have a plan, and if you do, I don't like it, and so I'll just take this one back for myself. The root cause of Solomon's downfall was that he felt a need for securities that God had told him that he didn't need. So question for you, where are you hedging your bed? Where do you not trust God enough to let go of the rope? God has promised his people, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Let's look at another area where Solomon's life, where he was not following God's command. Solomon not only ignored God's word concerning marriage, but he also ignored God's command which prohibits a king from multiplying gold in his house. Did you know that? Uh, God had a command that, that the king could not multiply gold for himself. And 1 Kings tells us that every year Solomon collected about 25 tons of gold for himself and that he had only gold articles in his house, his, his drinking vessels. Everything that he used was complete, solid gold. That sounds like multiplying gold to me. And remember, last week I explained how it took 150,000 laborers seven years to build the temple. Uh, well, Solomon spent 13 years building his palace. Solomon didn't have a brief lapse in sin. The progression of sin seems to have gone on gradually until he eventually collapsed when he was old. Look at, back at verse 4. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. Now it's interesting to me, at least, and, and maybe 
to you that David keeps being brought up here as kind of the model of obedience. Uh, if you know anything about David's life, he was not a perfect man. And David sinned and sinned in many ways very spectacularly. It, and we know that because it's all through Scripture. It's all through these uh, Samuel. It's all through the Psalms. Uh, uh, but the difference that we see between um, Solomon and Saul and, and uh, Paul, Solomon and David, uh, is that every time David fell, every time he sinned, he always returned with a broken and contrite heart in repentance. Psalm 51 is a great place to to uh, see a, an example of that. In David's life, we see, if we follow David's life and, and, and we see his life is kind of a roller coaster. If this is the presence of God and this is sin, uh, David was kind of in and out of the presence of God, but every time he was away from fellowship with God, he would repent and would return back to fellowship with God. That's not true for Solomon. What we see in Solomon is Solomon starts very strong and he starts in fellowship with God. But over the years, there is just a slow, steady decline until there is no fellowship uh, with, with God or, or even a concern of following his, his uh, commands. All through the life, if, if you'll notice what we've been missing in the life of Solomon is there's not a place where we see where Solomon confesses his sin to God or repents of his sin or he is even convicted of his sin. Uh, so that, there's a big difference between uh, what David did and what Solomon did. And so when we sin, uh, we follow the model of David, not Solomon. Solomon saw the problem but did not repent. When we sin, we should confess and repent like David did. But that's not what we naturally want to do. We want to deny sin. We want to rename sin. We want to redefine sin, ignore sin, manage sin. Or shift the blame for sin. The danger of sin is not how wicked or immoral the act is, but the danger of the fact that our sin drives the presence of God in that area of our lives away. When you reject God's commands, no matter how small, you put yourself outside of His protection, and that one area becomes an area through which the enemy injects poison into your life. J.D. Greer gave a, an illustration that I want to share with you. He, when he was speaking on this, um, he said, imagine that, that you are given a 5,000 square foot house, home, a beautiful condition with uh, all the upgrades. So far, so good, right? And the owner said that he'll give it to you and you can have full control over it, except he wants one control of one small nail in the family room. So one small nail it's driven into the wall of the family room. Otherwise, you can have control of all of that, but he wants to keep control of that nail and be able to do whatever he wants uh, with that nail. So you take that nail and um, you come back and, and, and see that the owner has hung a, a, dis, a dis, uh, diseased dead deer carcass on that nail, completely spoiling the whole house. Now that's what the enemy did with these small areas that Solomon didn't yield to God. Through his lack of submission to God with his wives and his gold, he smuggled in spiritual death. Where is that for you? Is that your relationships? Is that your money? Is that your friendships? Your music? Where are you allowing God? Where are you allowing this, this uh, spiritual death to, to come into your life? Usually, sin brings us down by degrees, not all at once. Chapter 11 feels like it comes out of nowhere, but it really doesn't. Solomon sowed the seeds of, seeds of destruction in small compromises, the same kind of compromises that you and I make in our lives every day. Solomon probably thought it's not a big deal. These things haven't hurt me yet. I'm fine. Nothing is more dangerous in the Christian life than sleeper cells of sin you haven't dealt with. You think that they are fine, but it's just a matter of time. Spurgeon uh, says it, describes sin this way. At first they can scarce, uh, he, he describes it as a spider web. At first they can scarcely be seen, and they seem as though they could break from, 
you can break from them in a moment. Then they become silken bonds, then firmer still until a man seems to be enveloped in tangled cables, and every cable hardens and becomes as iron or triple steel until at last there is no escaping. The greatest moral catastrophes happen, not all of a sudden, but by slow degrees. C.W. Lewis describes sin as a cancer that never stops growing in the background until you suddenly realize that it has, it has eaten away all of your desire for God. Maybe it's the sin of exaggeration, small lies that get you out of trouble, fear of others' opinion of you or what you've done, uh, temper flare-ups, lust. James describes sin as this, then desire when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. It's like a fire that starts small, but left unchecked, it eventually burns down a whole town. You have to take sin seriously in your life. John Owen said that you have to be actively killing it, or it will be killing you. There's a, it's, it's a proverb of sort, it's a saying, that has stuck with me and usually when I think of this it's when I've already moved from from God's presence and suddenly over time you kind of snap to yourself and you you look and you say how did I get here I, there's I don't remember taking that many steps away but this this little saying that, that has been in my mind and so when I'm when I'm out of God's presence I think of this this saying sin will take you farther than you want to go It'll keep you longer than you want to stay, and it'll cost you more than you want to pay. Let me say that again. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay, and it'll cost you more than you want to pay. Solomon was uh, also brought down by his uh, deceptive overconfidence. Can't blame him. You know, last week's sermon title was called, It's Good to Be King. He had it all. He had whatever he wanted at, at any command uh, he had. it. But he had a, a, a deceptive overconfidence of his spiritual life. Solomon had a nearly unbroken success. He had an unmistakable world-renowned spiritual gifts. He had accomplished more than any other king in Israel ever had. He had the incredible spiritual high points. He met with God twice. God appeared to him twice. And that made him lower his guard. Solomon brought into his own, he bought into his own hype. He read his own press statements and assumed that his role as God's chosen one meant that he was unique. Let me also mention here that in scripture, um, this same Solomon who asked for wisdom, not for his own sake, but for the sake of his people, God's, the people that he would lead, God's people. And now, later in life, it is Solomon that's leading the people away from God instead of toward God by the example of how he lived. His example of deliberate disobedience towards God's commandments was leading the people, God's people, astray. Few things destroy you faster than success, especially spiritual success. Because success makes you forget how desperately you need grace. Paul David Tripp, some of you read some of his books, speaks on why pastors uh, fall. Um, and his, his reason for that was that it, as a pastor, you forget that you are made of the same stuff as the other people you preach to. And you forget to be on guard against the indwelling sin in your own life. If you ever cease to be a participant in grace and only a preacher of grace, you are headed for disaster. John Newton says growth is growth in grace primarily means growth in the realization of your need for grace and independence of it. You show me a Christian whose, uh, whose dependence on grace is not greater than when we started, and I'll show you a Christian whose growth is artificial. Solomon was a man who had it all. The king who gave Israel a taste of blessing uh, God wanted to pour out through men. The wisest, the most successful man to ever live. Uh, 
but a man whose wisdom and success could not keep him from destroying himself. So when we get to uh, chapter 11 and verse 11, we see, we see a word, therefore. Therefore, so God has just told Solomon what his sins were. Therefore means here's what's going to happen based on your sin. There's consequences for sin. So verse 11. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, since this has been your practice and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Yet for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it in your days, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away the king. I will not tear away all of the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of David, my servant. And for the sake of Jerusalem that I have chosen. It may not look like it on the surface, but God is being extremely merciful to Solomon in these verses. God had every right to strike Solomon dead, and we've seen in, in uh, throughout the Old Testament that sometimes God does that very thing. Um, he had every right to strike Solomon dead. At the very least, God could have taken away his throne. Uh, could have taken him off of the throne or he could have taken away uh, the blessings that he was enjoying. Yet look what God does. He tells Solomon uh, what's going to happen, but he also tells him that it will not happen in his lifetime. As I mentioned, Solomon had not confessed or repented of his sins, and it seems that in an abundance of mercy here, that God has given Solomon one more chance. You see it? He's given Solomon one more chance to turn back to, to the, the, the God of Israel. But Solomon does not. It's in trials and pain and loss that we can recognize the mercy that God pours out upon his people. Lamentations is a great verse. It's one that you should memorize. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God also raises up in the following verses of, of this chapter. He raises up adversaries uh, against Solomon and against Israel. Remember last week we saw that God had given Solomon peace all around his, uh, all around his territory and his borders. And he had no adversaries. Well, now he has them on the north and the south. And they will pester and attack Solomon throughout the remainder of his life. Also, a man that, that you may or may not be familiar with uh, comes, to, comes to light. Uh, Jeroboam is a servant. Remember, God said he's going to turn the kingdom over to, to Solomon's servant. Well, this servant is Jeroboam. Uh, Jeroboam is met by a prophet. And, and the, there's an interesting backstory. The prophet takes off his robe. He rips it into 12 pieces symbolizing the 12 tribes of Israel. He tells Jeroboam, choose 10 of them. God is going to give you rule over these 10 tribes. Uh, but uh, So we see Jeroboam. And, and then God, very similar to how David came into the kingdom of Israel, uh, we see Jeroboam uh, made these promises in verse 37. And I will take you and you shall reign over all of this... All, Reign over all that your soul desires, and you shall be king over Israel. And if you will listen to all that I command you, and will walk in my ways, and do what is right in my eyes by keeping my statutes and my commands, as David my servant did, I will be with you and will build you a sure house as I built for David, and I will give all of Israel. God will make Jeroboam ruler over 10 of the tribes, 10 of the 12 tribes, and has promised that if, uh, if he will keep his statutes, if he'll keep his commands, that he will give Jeroboam uh, a house, an sure house, even one that compares to that of David. But we see in the following chapters, you can read those on your own, Jeroboam does not walk with the Lord. And again, Israel is in desperate need of a lasting, worthy Savior. God had promised David a son who would bring a glorious eternal kingdom, build a temple where the people could meet with God and rule with such wisdom that the whole world would recognize God and recognize that he was at work there. Israel naturally assumed that the promised son was Solomon, yet clearly he wasn't. And that's where the beauty of the Old Testament kicks in. 
centuries later, another descendant of David, another son, would show up. Some possessed all the same wisdom that Solomon had and much, much, much more. People came from far and near to hear him. But the center point of this son's life was not wise teaching or a glitzy, glitzy temple or a glitzy palace. It was his dying in shame for sinners. That's because the mission of his life was not to educate, but to save. He suffered for our foolishness so that he could forgive us for it and then put his spirit of wisdom within us so that we would not only understand the wise thing, not only understand, but the wise thing to do, but desire to do it. And because he died in our place, he can restore wisdom to those of us who, like Solomon, have messed up our lives with foolishness. Look at what God says to Solomon in verse 13. However, I will tear away all of the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem that I have chosen. Again, we've talked about this all through the series. Uh, Solomon was real good about repeating back promises to God. Here, God is repeating back some promises of his own. He's saying, I promise these things to David, therefore I'll do this. I promise this to David, so therefore I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue to hold one tribe in, in, your, in the hand of, of, of David's line. Uh, that tribe was Judah. Uh, and, they, and you know what's going to come out of Judah, what's going to come out of this tribe of Judah. Something greater than all wisdom of Solomon or the riches of Egypt, Jesus is going to come out of the tribe of Judah. Jesus, the wisdom of God, the glory of God, the riches of God, and that king will restore what you have lost through your foolishness. When you mess up your life in foolishness, which you inevitably will, hope in him. I think the whole point of Solomon's life is summed up in, in this, these verses in Hebrews uh, chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us also lay aside every weight and every sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Don't be like Solomon. Don't start well and let foolishness and lack of trust and small areas of compromise destroy your life. But let us keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and set down at the right hand of God. The victory has been won. The crown is yours. The verdict has been declared. You are an overcomer. You are a beloved, accepted child of the King. You are a victor. When you believe that, that Jesus ran and won the race in your place and that the victory and the place of acceptance before the Father has been given to you as a gift of grace, then God gives you the power to run victoriously in a way that Solomon never could. It's ironic that the only reason that the only ones who get better in the Christian life are those who realize that their acceptance by God is not dependent on their getting better. Let me say that again. I'll say it a little slower. The only ones who get better in the Christian life are those who realize that their acceptance by God is not dependent on their getting better. The point of Solomon's life was not to get wiser than Solomon and you'll succeed. Solomon had more wisdom than you will ever have or I will ever have, and he failed. The point is you need, to, you need something more than wisdom. You need a Savior. I need a Savior. Your family needs a Savior. This community needs a Savior. Our nation needs a savior. This world needs a savior. And all of mankind is, is dying for a savior. God has given us that savior through his son, Jesus Christ. Won't you hear his voice today?
and live in the good news of the gospel. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we can come to you today knowing that, um, that we can trust you in your promises. Lord, we're reminded through through these through these uh, chapters of, of First Kings that that you have promised your people many things, and you have been so faithful in keeping your promises, even when we are so disobedient, when we turn our backs completely on you, you continue to pour mercy out on us. Here we are in 2018, and in a small town in South Carolina, and Lord, we are still giving the same disobedience. We are still relying on our own talent. We're relying on whatever wealth we may have or whatever knowledge we may have or skill we may have. And you have told us over and over again to trust in you, to let go of the rope and to let you guide our lives. Lord, help us to be faithful in, in, in all things. Help us to be faithful in giving our very best to you and the very first gifts to you. Lord, challenge us to, to see what you can do and will do with our lives if we will only follow your commands. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for, uh, for saving us from, from an eternity completely separated from you. Lord, as we leave this place and we leave this story of Solomon, may we be reminded that the story is not about Solomon at all, but it was about a coming Savior, a Savior that now we can enjoy, that all future generations can enjoy and trust in because this Savior will endure forever. Lord, we thank you for your blessings. Thank you for this place. Thank you for what you continue to do here with these people this people that we call Beulah. Lord, continue to challenge us and let us shine brightly in this world that so desperately needs your mercy and your grace and your salvation. Bless us today. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's stay together. Lord, we Amen. We look forward to next week. I hope that you'll be back next week. We're going to hear from our Toronto team and looking forward to that. Um, uh, all of the, I, I assume all of them are going to be able to be here. I hope so. And then the following week, we're, we're going to do the Lord's Supper. Uh, so uh, begin to prepare for, for that. Uh, there will be a meeting, as we mentioned already, uh, in the fellowship hall just down this hallway. Uh, Terry will be waiting on us there to want to hear about how you can be involved in some of the school partnerships that, we should, that we're starting in just a few weeks. God bless you. Have a wonderful afternoon.